Thank you, Shepard, very much. It is historic. A Fox News alert for you. Read it and leave. No bull. There has been no bull like this ever. The longest bull market in history is on, and we are off. And for the next hour, we are all over this story. In fact, my friends, it is our only story. And here's why. 3,453 days. This is officially the longest bull market in history, defying history. And a lot of folks are telling us it is going to keep making history. It's that big, it's that important for our country, for our world. What has happened at the corner of Wall and Broad is something between stunning and numbing. Today, we look at how we got here and how long we can stay here and who helped get us here. The policies, the players, the politics, the presidents, the world, your world, and it starts now. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you. I'm Neil Cavuto and Fox on top of a raging bull. Few saw coming and few are still lasting, but it did more than 3,400 days ago. What started in the midst of a meltdown has redefined a country many thought was permanently down, out of money, out of credit, well, and we were told out of hope, but not, but not hopeless. Today, we follow the green. Now, you notice I did not say red or blue. You notice I didn't say anything about conservatives or liberals, Republicans or Democrats. This is about you how you picked yourself up and dusted yourself off and refused to believe the American dream was dead. It wasn't then, it isn't now. For the next hour, we'll show you how it all happened and what happens now with Susan Lee on how we overcame a financial crisis to become a financial powerhouse. Former New York Stock Exchange boss Dick Grasso on why he's so bullish on capitalism. Uber bear Jim Stack on why he's so worried about capitalism. Value investor stunner Foster Freeze on why he is still gung-ho on capitalism. Then CME chairman Terry Duffy on all that glitters is not just stocks. Former NASDAQ chairman Robert Greifeld on why this technology tear isn't like the last one. Then a look back at the giants who helped fuel this historic bull run, and we chatted with them on this show. Apple Steve Jobs, Amazon's Jeff Bezos, and Microsoft founder Bill Gates. Lots to get to, so let's get to it. With Susan Lee outside the New York Stock Exchange where it all went down. Hey, Susan. Hi, Neil. So bull market is defined as gains above 20%. So we are in the longest stretch in history, not necessarily the strongest, still a long road back for the depths of the global financial crisis. Markets plunging, banks collapsing, investors panicking. It was a great financial meltdown, but there wasn't anything great about it. It hollowed out companies as quickly as it cratered their stocks. Millions lost their jobs, millions more their life savings. Record numbers saw the value of their homes plummet if they were even lucky enough to hold on to those homes at all. It seemed anything of value kept losing it. A churning, unrelenting bottoming out that hit its lows on March 9, 2009, when the S&P 500 hit its prophetic low of 666. Few knew it at the time, but that would be the worst it would get. Barack Obama had been president for a little more than seven weeks, but a massive financial rescue of everything from battered banks and lenders to General Motors was on. And then there was Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke spending trillions of dollars buying back treasury notes and bonds to literally force interest rates to near zero. It worked and combined with innovations from tech giants including Apple, Amazon, and years later, Later, a social media company debuting on Wall Street called Facebook, things started turning around. Technology took the lead, but other sectors soon followed, buoyed by record interest rates and what would soon become a productivity boom. Then came Donald Trump, who many say took that boom and put it on steroids, slashing regulations and cutting taxes and putting new life in a bull market that some analysts thought had run out of steam. Turns out it hadn't and hasn't. It's been 3,453 days since that March 9, 2009 bottom in the S&P surpassing what had been the longest bull market in American history, the so-called Clinton boom of the 1990s. Technology led that boom, and come to think of it, technology has largely led this boom. But here's the difference and why so many diehard bulls are still so, well, bullish. This may be the longest bull market, but that 90s one remains the strongest. Stocks surged 417% back then. They're up 322% now. As some bulls see it, we still have some room to run.
Now, in just a few weeks, it will mark one decade since Lehman's collapse on September 15th, an event that resulted in big stock losses at the time, but from the ashes of which has sparked the longest ever bull market run. Neil, back to you. Susan, thank you. Great job. Susan, outside the New York Stock Exchange. So, does this bull have more room to run? Let's ask our market pros, Art Hogan in Boston, Melissa Armo in New York City, Fox Business Network's Lauren Simonetti at the NASDAQ, and uh, Ted Weisberg at the New York Stock Exchange will be joining us very shortly, an institution in his own right. Uh, let's get the read from Art Hogan. I mean, we always talk about the duration of bull markets, the strength of them. Because this is a record holder in terms of time, uh, it doesn't hold the record art in terms of uh, the appreciable run-up we had under under the Clint one. So, so bulls tell me that we've got more to run. What do you think? No, I have to agree with that, Neil. And, and you and I were together for both of these uh, bull markets and, and talked a lot about some of the underlying concepts here. But I think the underlying concept of the length of this bull market has a lot to do with the pace of the economic recovery we've seen since the Great Recession. So we never got a V-shaped recovery. So this gradual recovery had a gradual uh, bull market that continued to get better um, and, and continues to get better now. So I think you look at uh, the drivers and the drivers of the economy. So if you think the economy is moving, and I think we have a 4% GDP quarter coming up uh, this quarter and, and, and probably, you know, average 3% for the year. That's going to continue to drive earnings and earnings are going to continue to drive stocks higher. I think we've got a lot of runway in front of us and it doesn't look like a recession is anywhere near uh, the near term horizon. You know, Ted, uh, you've lived through a couple of bull and bear markets alike, I guess, and some scary times and some good times. How does this stack up to others you right. see? Well, of course, uh, when they're up, it always feels better, Neil. But <laughs> but this has uh, clearly been a dramatic. It's clearly been a dramatic run. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, if I go all the way back to 1974, when the Dow in November was playing 570, give or take a few points, and we look where we are now at 25,700. As far as I, as far as I'm concerned, we've been in the bull market for 44 years. Wow. Well, that is one way of looking at it. You know, Lawrence, of minute, one of the big yeah. uh, ties between this run-up and then the last run-up was technology. Um, and we learned at the Internet boom of the Clinton era that it, it, it was propelled by some companies that didn't de deserve to be part of the run. The difference right. this time is you have a lot of companies with established earnings and numbers that justify it. What are you hearing? And a lot of technology companies are really consumer companies. I think of Amazon, I think of Netflix. Their subscribers aren't going anywhere, if you ask me, anytime soon when you look at the boxes piling up on your doorstep, right? Absolutely. And when you look, not to get too technical, but when you look at the sectors, there are 11 S&P sectors. The top performing sector during this bull run is the consumer sector. So if you have tax cuts, if you have deregulation, if you have people getting jobs that are starting to pay more money, and interest rates don't flare up too much, then you have a consumer that stays strong and that propels the bull market. Melissa, when you look at and talk to investors, some of whom feel woulda, shoulda, coulda, I, I'm too late to get into this, what do you tell them? Well, I don't think it's too late or too soon. A lot of people are saying, oh my God, we missed it, or it's too late to get into it. No, that's not true. I think it's a perfect time to go long the market right here. Like you were saying earlier today, Ben Stein on your program said, hey, there's a lot of women that are not invested in the market. There's a lot of people that are not in this market. 55% of the people are in this market. That means 45% are not. If I went out and talked to people right now on the street down there, there's only 55% of them invested. That means a lot more people can buy into this market, and that will lift the market higher. All right, you know, Art, those same people could be leery, too, right? They could be holding off. Some of them are seared about that meltdown and have never forgotten it or what their parents experienced. What do you, what do you tell them? Well, I mean, those yeah, people... I... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Art. I will get back to you, Melissa. Go ahead. Yeah, Neil, I think that's a great question. And that's a, a question we face every year. We've got a very reflexive muscle memory that doesn't have to go far, that far back to see what a bear market looks like. And then we went through one of the worst ones we've seen. I think what you do have to tell investors, though, is, you know, and, and you and I talk about this all the time, over the course of history, having an allocation and uh, rebalancing your, uh, the, your, your portfolio is the best way for long-term investment. So, you know, to me, I think that telling that investor that either, you know, has been on the sidelines and thinking we've gone too far too fast which we heard you know for you know four out of five of the first five years and and telling them hey listen if the economy is continuing to grow we're continuing to innovate we're continuing to increase productivity stocks are going to do better and i think that's what the runway looks like in front of us right now right now you know uh, ted we've been the economic and the market engine of the world we lead the way and that's been the wind at the president's back and getting tough on trade what have you do you worry though that it could blow up in our face 
Well, it's, it can always blow up, Neil. You know, the, you know even a broken clock is going to be right twice a day. Uh, and, uh, you know, stocks are, ri stocks are risky at any level. But at the end of the day, it's about, it's about the Fed, who's the, always the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and it's corporate earnings. And at the moment, interest rates are at relatively historic lows. You have a reasonably accommodative Fed, and we have very, very good corporate earnings, all of which create a very positive backdrop for stocks. And I would think that the lines of least resistance for the market are up, not down. They're not going straight up. You know, there'll be bumps along the way, but go back to uh, November of 1974, and you can make a pretty compelling case for owning stocks for the long term. Yeah, you really could. You know, uh, Lauren, a lot of people look at this ongoing uh, trade uh, give and take as, yeah. as much to do about nothing. Cooler heads will prevail. We'll get something that will, will calm everybody, and uh, the, the uncertainty will go away, and stocks go still higher. What do you think of that? You know, we've seen barriers to this bull market. We've seen Russia, we've seen North Korea, and it seems like nothing can really take it down in a meaningful way. Then you have the issue of trade, and of course this is the wild card right now, but the Federal Reserve is concerned about how this potential trade war plays out. What a trade war would do is cause prices to go up. That is inflation, and that is something that the Federal Reserve, who's all but guaranteed us a rate hike next month in, in September, that would force them maybe to hike interest rates a little bit more aggressively, and that could derail the bull market, yes. Melissa, is this a rich market to you? No, it's not rich at all, and let me tell you why. Because the market based from February up until now for eight solid months, so the market rested almost all of 2018. To me, I'm looking at the market technically higher because we rested for eight months. We're going to break out. And I will say this, in reference to your question earlier, most of the time the market has existed, it is bullish. And the reason is because there's a lot of 401k money and mutual funds in the market, and they go long. So the chances of the market ever going bearish is slim to none and it, if, if and when it happens it happens for a brief period and then it recovers well, so that's not all the time i mean you know bear markets can last a while too you know i know but overall if you look right. at the life of the market if you're in for a little long haul which people should be for the retirement that's the point all right guys i want to thank you all very very much fast moving news day uh you put this one in perspective i do appreciate it you know when this whole bull market began uh you know the median price of an existing home was around 170 grand 170 thousand dollars now closer to 270 thousand dollars so you would think wow that's great right no 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 legendary investor jim stack gets worried he'll explain why after this